Hello everyone. I am delighted to close this session on the links between mental health and climate change, and I will focus for this presentation on the part of action and part of the solutions of adaptation, since as we said, the problem is now engaged, and unless we invent a time machine, A priori, there is no technology that will allow us uh, to solve other uh, problem, that is to say to go back since other uh, millions of tons of carbon have been released into the atmosphere and it is only one of the planetary limits that has been exceeded. And so that is why I insisted at the time of preparing this conference on the fact that we should not limit ourselves only to climate change but that is what brings us together today. So, as we said, it is quite normal to develop eco-anxiety when we live in a world in which Antonio Gauter, who is the president of the UN, tells us that we have opened the gates of hell, in a world in which rainwater is contaminated by eternal plastics and that we are starting to find these plastics in the human body and, in particular in 2024, a study that caused a stir in human penises. So perhaps the patriarchy will feel concerned and then we saw it more recently with the events that happened in Spain and so we highlighted it during the first two presentations. These are the same people who say the rain must stop and who take the plane to go on vacation to cut off the winter. So for me the real pathology, we suggested it, EH, it is the ECIS and not eco-anxiety. And so I think that this is a problem that was addressed in the first two presentations, it is the risk of and it was well said eh of psychiatrizing or pathologizing. And besides, I specify that I was presented as the psychiatric component following the public health and psychological component, but in fact, I am also in the psychological component because psychotherapy and also in the public health component researcher in public health. And here, I present to you the results of studies that we did with Guillaume Chavance, who presented the first part, which are not yet published, and which show us that energy intensity, that is to say the energy that we spend per inhabitant, has only allowed us to improve part of our health. This is the part that concerns transmissible infectious diseases within particular for example vaccines, hygiene, the creation of drinking water circuits. But that our energy, there is a large part that we use in a way that destroys our health in fact with an increase in chronic diseases. And so for example the most obvious examples are the increase in sedentary lifestyle, so the time spent sitting or lying down which is not the same thing as the lack of physical activity. So I insist on this also because these are things that are not always integrated into the population and so we can on the one hand fight against sedentary lifestyle by trying for example to work standing up. So as I speak to you, I am standing and I attended this entire presentation standing up and on the other hand develop one's physical activity in particular with active transport. We will come back to this. What we see in modern societies is that there is an exponential relationship between the energy expended by health systems and the cost of the environmental footprint from every point of view, that is to say both in carbon emissions but also in the cost of extracting metals, for example, of depleting the planet's resources, and that at some point we will have to ask ourselves where we actually stop when we see the excessive energy cost that we gain to gain a few points in health system quality indices. Then another question that has therefore gone around the world these results because in fact there are countries that we see are under the black curve, so in fact which are doing much better than others in the link between the optimization between the energy expended by the health system and therefore the parameters of access to care and quality of care. So that generates a lot of thinking in the organization of care. And another thing that also challenges us is that we could say that we are supposed to be in better mental health since that is what brings us together today. So mental health, stress, anxiety, depression, concentration problems, sleep disorders, cognitive decline. We should be in better mental health in countries that spend more energy on our health. And we see that this is not the case because in fact there are correlations. So correlation is not causality but it still challenges us. That is to say that the more the country spends energy on its health and the more eating disorders appear, the more tension disorders and the more addictive disorders increase, and therefore with any type of addiction to substances.
So these are phenomena that open up the way we use this energy. So now, to take concrete action based on, for example, healthcare system establishments because healthcare systems represent around 8% of carbon emissions. So it's a huge expense item. And so there are debates around the relative proportions of each item, but overall we're going to focus on a few major emission items. By healthcare establishments for example, and so in particular, there's the issue of medicines. Medicines, so there are life cycle analyses, LCAs which are very complex. We have a lot of difficulty since medicines are produced on a global level and you have followed, like me, the thinking around the tensions which concern medicines. And so there was the whole recent subject of prawn with Sanofi. So medicines have probably explosive carbon footprints but which we can't quantify. So we can, we just know in fact that it's a huge source of carbon emissions. And in psychiatry, so I have a doctorate in psychiatry in molecular and cellular biology. In psychiatry, there is a real trend that is emerging and particularly in the 30 to 50 generation without wanting to stigmatize people but so it's just an observation of which is the question of deprescribing in fact. That is to say that in fact during psychiatry studies, we are taught to prescribe, we are not taught to deprescribe. And so, it is a real field of research now which is supported, among others, by Professor Fabrice Barna in Strasbourg and which therefore there are now clinical guides to deprescribe antidepressants, deprescribe anxiolytics since you see it here. 40% of patients currently who start treatment with benzodiazepine, therefore anxiolytics, will never stop it and that is really common clinical practice. People who come after 25 years of prescription and who say, I was never told that I had to stop it. And so, when we are faced with anxiety, whether it is linked to climate change or not, there are still a lot of oncologic prescriptions that can help occasionally, but we really need to be extremely vigilant about stopping them as soon as they are no longer necessary. And that is a real issue and we will see what alternatives and especially the prevention that we can put in place to avoid these situations. It should also be noted that caregivers are absolutely not exemplary, contrary to what their role expects. In fact, caregivers normally have a duty to set an example because they are part of the professions that are valued and listened to by the population. Even if COVID has had consequences in terms of trust in the words of health professionals and overall in fact there is listening and attention paid to health professionals who speak out. Now, health professionals should know that 33% in the Amadeus study that we conducted in 2021, so at the time of the third COVID wave, so we were after the big COVID phenomenon, we had resumed routine care. There was no deprogramming, there was no saturation of intensive care units. So we had resumed a so-called normal life, as normal as possible. And so there, we had 33% of caregivers who met the clinical characteristics of a depressive episode. 80% of them reported having already had a depressive episode during their life. And among those who met the criteria for a major depression, there were only 23% who were taking an antidepressant and 13% who had psychiatric monitoring, which are normally two of the pillars of care with psychotherapeutic monitoring. So that means that caregivers are poorly treated in fact for their mental health and for other health criteria as well as physical. They do little physical activity and they also have high rates of overweight and obesity. Now we have knowledge that has exploded over the last 15 years on the links between the intestine and the brain. And ah uh, so I'll quickly go over that. We know that the bacteria in our microbiota, this packet of 1.5 bacteria that we have in the intestine communicates with our brain and in particular with emotional airs via the vagus nerve. That this microbiota influences the absorption of essential nutrients for our brain. For example, tryptophan which is a precursor of serotonin, involved in many mental disorders, 
that this microbiota will synthesize short-chain fatty acids that will nourish not only the cells of the intestine, but also the growing nervous system and which can play a role in neurodevelopmental disorders in children that will synthesize neurotransmitters such as serotonin which we talked about, dopamine, acetylene, and noradrenaline which is found at 95% in the lumen of the intestine and above all that it will strengthen our immune system and the links between immunity and mental health are now perfectly established. The more I am on the immune level and the more I increase my risk of stress, anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, concentration and above all I accelerate the cellular aging of my organs and in particular my brain. In the loop, loop with a descending system that Eileen spoke about just before, the cortisol system, in fact, which will therefore increase in the event of stress and which will increase especially the permeability of the intestine whereas normally the intestine was impermeable and therefore that, that will create vicious loops between the 10 functions of the microbiota and dysfunctions of the brain. Why am I talking about this? It is because currently our modern lifestyle subjects us to a diet that is mainly ultra-processed and this ultra-processing impoverishes our diet in nutrients and that is why we talk about ultra-processed products and no longer ultra-processed foods since we can no longer call food in fact a substance that will harm us more than it will improve our health. Normally, the function of a food is to nourish our body and preserve our health. Here, we are faced with products that contain calories but are low in nutrients. So it will create malnutrition situations with an excess of calories on one side which will create inflammation, a very inflammatory parasol fat around our screws and on the other side impoverishes in essential nutrients, particularly essential for our mental health and our brain. What does the current scientific consensus say? I insist on the scientific consensus since there are doctors who are currently speaking out on social networks to defend the consumption of meat in particular. What the consensual data says, what this data says, is that it is the Mediterranean type diet that has the best protection on general health and particularly on cardiovascular health. So already this first point is extremely important since our brain is vascularized, so our mental health depends directly on the state of health of our arteries. The Mediterranean diet, as a reminder, is a predominantly plant-based diet. That doesn't mean it's vegetarianism. It is therefore a majority of fruits, vegetables and legumes consumed every day that will nourish the microbiota of our intestine with fiber in particular which will be very important in its diversity to diversify the bacteria in our intestine. Currently, we know that one in four people in good apparent health have a weakening of their intestinal microbiota. That is to say, we are witnessing a collapse in the biodiversity of the bacteria in our intestine at the same time as we are witnessing biodiversity, its collapse in our environment. This is one of the examples of the one of the interconnection of planetary health, human health and animal health. And so, in this Mediterranean diet, we see that meat and fish are reduced to a few portions per week and, particularly in France, we know that we consume three times too much meat since the 2021 figures showed that the average consumption per capita was 1.6 kilograms of meat while the health recommendations are 500 grams per week. So I insist, we are on health recommendations, not on environmental recommendations. And we see that the majority of people do not follow health recommendations. This will be very important for the rest of our thinking. It is now demonstrated by intervention studies that the Mediterranean diet improves symptoms of depression in depressed people. Here, you see a meta-analysis that was published in 2024 with five trials against randomized. What this meta-analysis shows is that there is a significant effect but that there is also a very strong heterogeneity of intervention. Which means that there are people who will respond a lot to the intervention and others not at all. Which is logical because ultimately when we look at the current definition of depression, we have more than 150 different forms of combination of symptoms and that above all we must go to the level of etiology, that is to say that behind the same depression phenotype, we will have different causes. 
If you would like to participate in this research on the links between nutrition, physical activity and mental health, currently we are distributing the food study too because it is phase 2. So, we are analyzing the data from phase 1 and we are looking for people to participate in phase 2. You can type food 2 and FRME for example and you will find the link to the study or contact me on social networks. Currently, you have followed like me the political debates taking place in the National Assembly around the taxation of ultra-processed products. Too rich in added sugar and really for me, it would be a health disaster if this bill did not go through. So I really hope with all my heart that the political system will not hinder in my opinion this bill which is absolutely crucial. It is important for us all to agree that contrary to what I was taught 20 years ago in my medical studies, we can no longer say that food, even healthy food, is not enough to nourish our brains. Why? I will take two examples that are not all the examples, E.H., but we had to go to the most important, the most prevalent. We must start by remembering that 80% of individuals do not manage to achieve the objectives of what we call a healthy diet. So we must also stop giving messages in public health messages where 80% of people do not manage to achieve them because that develops the feeling of helplessness and guilt and that is the opposite of what we want since, as we said previously, we want a feeling of effectiveness adapted to the person's possibilities. We talked about conflicts, for example, within families around food and so we must propose solutions adapted to people's situations and not pious wishes that are impossible to achieve. Currently, regarding omega-3 for example, we have very demanding French recommendations and rightly so issued by ANCES to consume 250 mg of DHA and 250 mg of PA per day. Here you see the prevalence of omega-3 deficiencies in the world. It was based on cardiology studies with blood tests and you see in fact that there are more than 80% of the world population who do not achieve the objectives of good cardiovascular health if we base ourselves on the levels of omega-3 that we measure in red blood cells. Omega-3 are essential fatty acids that we cannot synthesize that will soften our arteries but also, above all, that will nourish our neurons. DHA is 50% of the lipids in neurons. If I am deficient in omega-3, I will see mental health problems increase my vulnerability. To mental health will increase to stress, anxiety, depression, tension disorder, sleep disorder and I will accelerate the cognitive decline of my brain. So why can't we say that all we have to do is eat sardines to get enough omega-3? This is a message that we hear from a very publicized general practitioner at the moment. So, it's not that it's not possible for multiple reasons, I'm not going to mention them all, but we can already point out that more than half of the fish that are currently consumed are farmed fish and that for economic reasons. Farmed fish are now mainly fed with vegetable oils and flours that do not contain DHA. So that's very important because fish actually do not synthesize DHA. DHA basically comes from the plankton that small fish eat. And so for a while, farmed fish were fed with flowers and oils from small fish that were unpopular with humans. And now in fact the global stock of DHA has not increased and neither has the stock of wild fish because otherwise we will empty the oceans. You see that since the 80s the stock of wild fish has not increased while the world population has increased. So, if we tell everyone in a public health message to eat fish and especially oily fish, even one portion per week, which is insufficient to achieve the omega-3 objectives, even with this recommendation that seems simple, in fact, we would need seven times more fish than we currently have in stock to feed the brains of humanity. So, when we make public health messages, we really have to think about planetary health. And I say this above all for us in the medical profession. Algae are the solution at the moment. In fact, the origin of DHA, so you understood, the DHA deficiency, 
is the most hidden of all global deficiencies. In fact, we have talked a lot about iron, for example, and rightly so. There are problems with anemia, a uh, deficiency, anemia, there are a lot of risks, for example, in pregnant women for the development of the infant, we are okay with that. On the other hand, no global health policy, particularly at the WHO level, takes into account DHA deficiencies despite the figures I presented to you, and there is no explanation for that, but it is probably not insignificant. One of the solutions, or even the solution in fact, is the only one since it is the origin of DHA, is to go directly to the level of the algae that synthesizes DHA. So here, you see schizo that we can synthesize industrially, covered, which allows us to protect ourselves from heavy metals. Since the other problem, when we eat a lot of fish, is that we are going to eat, you have seen, uh, the, the scandal that is around the ton. In fact, two weeks ago it was broadcast, uh, in the media, that the ton that we consume in cans contains a lot of heavy metals, in particular cadmium and methylmercury, which are going to be stored in the brain and destroy our neurons, accelerate aging, including other organs of our body. And so eating fish up becomes problematic for health. While it was a food that was perceived as a good food for health, now the benefit and the risk are really to be put in the balance. And that is because we have really poisoned our environment. So, and on top of all that, there are the eternal plastics that also live in the problem and that are only just beginning to be studied in health studies. So, for all these reasons, my point is that we could develop DHA from algae in quantity and that the best way to bring DHA to the brain is encapsulation. It is the capsule rather than fortified foods which ultimately will result in a lot of waste, loss and especially when we consume large fatty fish like salmon and tuna. In fact 90% of DHA is lost in the food chain. This is what we call trophic losses. So we might as well go directly to the source of DHA. That is what I propose. Another example that is really striking is the example of vitamin D. There are people who still say that nothing works in COVID when there is a meta-analysis that showed, with all the rigor necessary for the methylizes, that vitamin D supplementation was associated with less COVID infection and less admission to intensive care units for COVID. So we have this famous molecule, we have talked a lot about hydroxychloroquine and other molecules. Here, we have a molecule that has no adverse effects, that is available, that is not in tension and that can be prescribed. ANCES and CPAM, the primary health insurance fund tell us that it is not necessary to supplement. The ANS published three reports in 2012, 2015, 2021. All these reports say that vitamin D deficiency is extremely prevalent in France that 100% of people do not have sufficient dietary intake of vitamin D, that it would take to cover the needs of 97% of the population, 15 microg per day, while women on average 3 and men 5. So, we are between 3 and 5 times less than what would be needed to have sufficient vitamin D coverage. And above all, my point is that we need to move away from the logic of the cure because currently what we expect is to have health problems to have a possible prescription for doctors who are aware of the subject, supplementation with very high doses. When in fact we should be taking vitamin D because our diet is not enough to provide it and exposure to the sun is not enough most of the time either. To have sufficient vitamin D levels, you need to be exposed to a significant part of the body, that is to say the torso for 25 minutes in the middle of the day, in July-August. So most of us do not actually reach these sun exposure objectives. And so all this is documented in the 1K3 study, uh, which was conducted in France, which showed the inadequacies in dietary intake despite vitamin D enriched products such as dairy products. It is not enough to stop these vitamin D deficiencies. And one of the realizations is that the brain cannot store. So we can't say, I took my three ampules in November, December, January, I'm fine for the rest of the year. That's what the majority of practitioners are doing right now. But it's not logical because in fact, the rest of the year, we also need vitamin D, especially for regulating the immune system. It's a steroid hormone that will influence the immune system and mental health. 
And now, we have an umbrella meta-analysis. It's the highest level of evidence. So, a collection of meta-analysis that confirms the effectiveness of vitamin D supplementation in depression. Everything I'm telling you is included in international recommendations for the practice of psychonutrition published in 2022. So it's not my opinion, it's not something free electron, it's international recommendations from the World Federation of Biological Psychiatry, the WFSBP in collaboration with CANMAT, the Canadian Association for the Treatment of Anxiety Depressive Disorders. So, all of this is perfectly validated by researchers from 15 different countries, 31 researchers from 15 countries who represented both the West and the East, because there was too strong a tropism and in the West, we are too little aware of this data, and to establish prescription recommendations in mental health. And so we have in these guides levels of proof and the omega-3 that I presented to you, vitamin D currently have the highest level of proof for prescription. There are other nutrients that have proven their effectiveness on which I will go more finally I will go it is zinc, methylfolate A and probiotics and still other nutrients that would be interesting to explore but we are short of time today. Let's also remember that we are in a consumer society and that it poses a problem when we demonstrate, for example, in a meta-analysis that therapeutic fasting, that is to say reducing the absorption of calories below 500 kilograms calories per day under medical supervision, I insist, and not doing it alone at home. Under medical supervision reduces stress, anxiety and depression. This publication had absolutely no echo at the media and journalistic level, unlike others. For example, the one on the prevalence of depression among caregivers. It had very wide coverage, uh, at different levels, press, television and radio and their complete radio silence. So we are in a society where the question of fasting is a controversial question. So it also comes from the field of oncology where there have been abuses and then a representation that it is an alternative or complementary medicine and that it delays people's access to care. So I insist on that. What I am presenting to you is not complementary or alternative medicine, it is at the heart of conventional medicine. The WFSBP data are published in guidelines, therefore recommendations for the clinical practice of all mental health practitioners on the surface of the planet. It is also important to remember, it is a very little known and especially very a put aside, it is really mental denial. Tobacco multiplies by one the risk of developing depression and it has been shown that it was a causal factor. It is not just a correlation, an association. There are Mendenay randomization studies that show that it is a causal factor in triggering depression. Smokers trigger more depression than non-smokers. And so we still have 30% of the population who smoke daily and in addition it is responsible for deforestation. So we see again an example of a simple action that can so we are currently in November, it is the month without tobacco. We have a simple action that allows us to both improve our mental health and improve planetary health. In this study, we see more precisely on physical activity a U-shaped curve that means we can target, we know that physical activity improves depression and when we are in a state of depression, we lack motivation. And so that is where it is important to be able to support change effectively and there are plenty of hyper-efficient teams to support what we call adapted activity but which is too little implemented due to ignorance or lack of time in mental health teams currently. And so we have put the metabolic equivalents that we can calculate and we now know that a goal between 20 and 40 meters per week is the ideal goal to achieve so with an optimum at 25 to protect our mental health and we can implement this with active transport for example to get to work when possible. So then it is the urban community that is called upon. We actually set it for exposure to ultra toxic news. So we also have to look at how we feed our minds on a daily basis. The media have a great responsibility so we have to choose these media carefully. So without playing the other's politics but also without exposing ourselves to information that makes us powerless. That's really it. And then also think about our lifestyle. 
If we're constantly waiting for Friday and constantly waiting to take the plane to go to the other side of the world, it's probably because the choices we're currently making in our lives are harming our mental health and that sometimes there are painful choices that have to be made but which are necessary to change our lives and that's not easy to put in place and sometimes it requires the support of a mental health professional. The other thing too is that I wanted to point out that when we talk about the growth, it's a word that hasn't been used today, but which is still underlying the action in fact, because most of the actions in fact, it's not about doing more things, it's about stopping doing things that we actually do. So theoretically it requires less effort in fact to be in action for all the environmental transition. So for example, stopping taking the plane, stopping uh taking your car, but of course, it requires an effort uh in the adaptation afterwards. And so on the other hand, we also have an infinite growth of things that uh cost nothing to our planet and in particular to the imagination. Ah uh, so there you go, I wanted to pay tribute to all the people who feed our imagination and who make the greatest journey, the inner journey. I also wanted to end on a note of hope by recalling that in the Damadeus study that I presented among caregivers, the best protective factor against depression is relationships of trust, what we call emotional support between colleagues. And so, in contrast to professional support, it is not technical assistance, it is emotional assistance. It is the fact of being able to feel that we can count on our colleagues emotionally. So we talked about the bonds that unite us and indeed it is one of the keys and I wanted to end with this sentence from Pablo Servin that we spoke about previously. The most committed people are the happiest. Thank you for your attention.